tonight's discussion about local Cleveland history. And I'd like to introduce both of them and in very short order, turn it over to them to get the evening started. Um, Sean Martin is Associate Curator for Jewish History at Western Reserve Historical Society. He's the author of Jewish Life in Krakow, 1918 to 1939, and A Stitch in Time, The Cleveland Garment Industry, and author and editor of For the Good of the Nation, Institutions for Jewish Children and Interwar Poland. Samantha Baskind is a professor of art history at Cleveland State University, has authored five books, and is a co-editor of the foundational volume on Jewish graphic novels. She served as the editor for U.S. Art for the Revised Encyclopedia Judaica, and is currently the series editor of, you're going to have to help me out, Samantha. Dim, you know, pronounce it for me. Can you say it? The, Try again, you're unmuted now. Ugh. Pronounce yeah. the dim you note. How do you pronounce yes. it? Yes. Yes. Dimi Got it. Yes. I feel like I should have practiced that in advance. Uh, Jews and the cultural imagination, which sounds really interesting. And now I feel compelled, like we should all run out and go check it out immediately. Um, without further ado, Samantha and Sean, please lead the conversation on comics. So Thank thanks you. so much. Thanks so much, Dahlia. Um, and, and thanks so much, Samantha, for, for agreeing to have the conversation this evening. Um, I would just like to uh, introduce the book a bit uh, in which uh, Samantha's essay has been published. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I had just have some questions for Samantha as we go through the evening. So um, first, uh, the title of the book is Cleveland Jews and the Making of a Midwestern Community. And it was published by uh, Rutgers University Press in February uh, of this year. Uh, and so uh, really just before uh, we all locked down and, and just in, in the recent months have we had time to, to organize these events. So we're all glad that you could join us. The book is uh, the result of, uh, well, really a decades long collaboration between the Jewish Federation and the Western Reserve Historical Society, where the Cleveland Jewish Archives are located. Uh, and uh, it is an effort to uh, update the history of uh, Jewish Cleveland to the 20th century. So one of the earlier books on the Cleveland Jewish community is A History of the Jews of Cleveland by Lloyd Gartner. And that book was published in the 70s, but it had been written in the 50s, and uh, there was a need to really update that. And our response to this need to update that volume uh, it was, is the, the, the book that was just published. What we did was really to gather a group of scholars from all around the world, from the United States, from Canada, from Israel, uh, to uh, contribute their thoughts on specific topics related to Jewish Cleveland. Um, and we had uh, a whole range of topics treated from the history of the Orthodox community to the history of Jewish education, uh, suburbanization, Black Jewish relations, um, Abba Hillel Silver and ethnic politics, Soviet Jewish immigration, um, suburban temple, uh, and the National Council of Jewish Women, uh, and uh, Harvey Picard. Um, Harvey P. Carr, uh, a special figure here in Cleveland, uh, and uh, Samantha Baskin agreed to write about uh, this author, this graphic novelist for us. Uh, and uh, we were so grateful that she could because he uh, is a, a figure that, a local figure that really uh, deserves much more attention. And so what I'd like to do now actually is share my screen so you can see a, co a cover of his comic, American Splendor. Uh, and then I'm just going to ask Samantha really to first tell us about um, her choice of topic here uh, and to, to essentially uh, give us an overview of the article uh, to start off the conversation. Uh, it would also, one more thing, I'd like to encourage you to, uh, uh, if you are able, um, encourage you to uh, share your thoughts, comments, questions in chat. We'll be moderating the chat throughout and getting to the questions uh, at the end of uh, the end of the session. So take it away, Samantha. Thank you. 
Okay. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Sean? Yes. Yep. I can okay, hear you. Great. I, there, I should say there's a party next door to my house right now and they have a band playing. So I'm going to do the best that I can. You're going to hear some noise. So I decided I wanted, to, when Sean asked me to write something for this book on Jews in Cleveland, what I really wanted to do as an art historian was to illuminate some aspect of artistic history in Cleveland. So there's really interesting art in various temples, which of course was a possibility. And then I was nudged as someone who has written extensively about comics and graphic novels to write about Superman's creators, Siegel and Schuster. But it's well known in Cleveland that the brainchild of two Jews, Siegel and Schuster, was Superman. It debuted in Action Comics in 1938 and inspired a superhero genre. And Cleveland Jews and Clevelanders embraced that history. And so I wanted to do something different because almost 40 years later in 1976, another Jew from Cleveland propelled the comic genre. And that interested me. And Harvey really, he, what he did was very different. It's not fantasy, it's reality. It's very postmodern and self-referential. And it begins with American Splendor, which you can see up on your screen. But I wanna say just in relationship to Cleveland comics history, that it's striking that Siegel, Schuster and Harvey are all the children of immigrants. They're all from Cleveland and their work has been explored from Jewish, a Jewish perspective and otherwise. And I think that Harvey's kind of background and unabashedly Cleveland-centered stories could use some fleshing out, which is why I decided to write my chapter on Harvey. I'm interested in his sort of quotidian comic persona. How did it connect with Cleveland, the city he loved? And what role does his Jewish identity kind of play in his sequential art? And that, that really begins with American Splendor, a just underappreciated comic book series that was originally published by him, self-published, and then ultimately picked up by a publisher. And it was, we have many of these volumes, they explore kind of his everyday life. He was a file clerk at, at the VA, you know, just sort of slice of life fodder is what he explores with a stable of artists. And one of them might actually be on this Zoom, I'm not sure, Gary Dumb. He did, he worked on this particular issue that you have in front of you, as well as a comic that I'm gonna show in a little bit. In any case, Harvey is so interesting because he just, he can find interest in the mundane, he can, he can really, he exploits his own life. We learn a lot about him. And American Splendor's tagline is, from off the streets of Cleveland comes, which contrasts greatly with Siegel and Schuster. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. This is, this is Gary's particular comic. I'm not gonna talk about this one quite yet. It's a terrific three-pager and it's really important. Well, well, I should just jump into it. Want me to just jump into this one, Sean? No, I'm sorry. I'm I'm having some difficulties controlling my screen. So okay. <laughs> that's all that that was about. All right. So let me then I'll I'll just say a few more words about American <laughs> Splendor. We, as I said, we learned so much about Harvey's life through this. We learn about his he has chronic depression. He's stingy. He gets easily frustrated. He's quote with women and. Did you hear that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll try to try to fix that. Okay. In any case, we're dealing with Harvey deals with. Okay. I'm unmuted. Yeah. All right. So, in any case, I don't even know where I was. This is not escapism. This is, in some ways, some would say Harvey's comics are about a world that you would want to escape from. And I have this particular cover of American Splendor up. It's terrific. There are so many, I wish I could talk about all of them. But I thought it was interesting 
it's actually not on the streets of Cleveland. It's you know sort of a flashback. He's at home with his mom, and he's saying, you know, that that his milk looks kind of yellow. But what's interesting about it in this short period of time is that his mom says it's good for you, Herschel, and that's Harvey's Yiddish name. And Harvey has different personas. He sometimes calls himself our man. He sometimes calls himself Herschel. And of course, he's Harvey to all of us who love him. So this is just the, like one example of his Jewish identity coming out. And his Jewish identity is very deeply connected to the city of Cleveland, the city that he loved. He's been called the poet laureate of Cleveland. He has a great, there's a great little um, snippet in Harvey P. Carr's Cleveland, which is a book just about Cleveland and his life, in which he calls him, he says he's Cleveland Heights' answer to Tevia the milkman. And it shows him opening up his refrigerator and drinking from a milk carton. Do we, do we want to go to the next, do you want to ask another question, Sean? Oh yeah, so let me just um, kind of step back a bit. So can you tell us more about the comparison between Siegel and Schuster uh, and, and Harvey? Um, and I should say for the audience that, that Samantha and I had a conversation and decided that, that we would refer to him as Harvey throughout the evening. Um, this was a, a, a man that we thought would appreciate that. He was well loved really by, by many. And so we were just going to call him Harvey throughout the evening. Um, just tell us more about their comparison. How, how do their achievements compare? Um, what is the difference between a comic character like Superman uh, and, and Harvey's persona uh, in American Splendor? So we're all much more familiar with comic books that explore superheroes, right? We know lots of superheroes. We've got Captain America and we have Superman and Wonder Woman and so forth. And they were extremely popular beginning with Siegel and Schuster's Superman. I mean, Siegel and Schuster really spawned a genre onto its, you know, we have many, you know, men in, in, in their tights and their capes, and they, they're a part of our culture, Marvel and DC and so forth. But, and that was the beginning of comics and also famous funnies and adventure comics. Really, the autobiographical mode of comics is spearheaded by Harvey Picar, our Clevelander. He begins this with American Splendor. You know, he 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 le le lets himself out there, and this and he's he's a pioneer, and he's I don't think he's appreciated in Cleveland as much as he should be. Surely, in the comics world and underground comics, we know him, we love him, we love his work. But it's important to note that what he did. He did it before Art Spiegelman made Mouse, that you know, very autobiographical um, exploration of Spiegelman's reaction to his father's Holocaust experience, as well as his father's Holocaust experience. Harvey did this first. And Harvey, in fact, he did not think much of Art Spiegelman's Mouse. He felt it was maybe exploiting the Holocaust. The bestiary of characters was not appealing to him. And when we talk about um, Harvey's Harvey's um, interest in Israel and his perspective on Israel, we can maybe address that a little bit more. But in short, there are many different kinds of comics. And this newer version, right, this more postmodern version of comics that's so self-referential is really um, brought to the fore and so important, and Harvey Picar is so important in, in the history of it. How did he get a start as a writer? Well, he was a, he was a jazz critic and he loved jazz. He was a, he's just a great writer, but he became friends with, he became friends with R. Crumb, who was an underground comics luminary. Their love of jazz brought them together really. And he, he presented Crumb with a series of stick figures and an idea for a story. And Crumb really encouraged him to pursue this interest and ultimately Crumb illustrated something for him, his, his first sort of comic attempts in the early 70s, which ultimately led to American Splendor. So Crumb really helped Harvey move his move along. And then he has a whole new stable of writers, you know, artist collaborators over time, including 
JT Waldman and Gary Dumm and Dean Hasville and Joseph Remnant and so many others that depict Harvey in different ways. So Harvey, the way Harvey might look in one comic or one story or one issue is not how he's going to look necessarily in another because we have an author, Harvey, who writes comics and then we'll have his artist collaborators. Can you tell us more about the differences between comics and graphic novels? We're familiar with them. We've, we've read comics and we've read graphic novels, but how do they differ and where is Harvey in the development of this graphic novel that we've seen so much over the past decades? So we have comic books, begins in the 1930s when famous funnies and so forth are, you know, put between covers, you know, the, the week, the daily issues in the newspaper are put between covers, and then ultimately new content is brought out. So we have comic books. But then a figure named Will Eisner, who also happens to be Jewish, sort of writes a, com a graphic novel called A Contract with God. So we call him the father of the graphic novel versus comics or comic books. And so Harvey's foray into graphic novels, which comes much later in his life, and some were posthumously published, is very different than his comic books, right? This is between two covers, or two you know, paper covers, it's got newsprint, and full-length graphic novel is a much more serious, usually, attempt to explore issues. Okay, thank you for, for explaining, explaining that in, in the different genres. Um, if we could talk about the, the content of his work, um, how did his experience as a Jew from Cleveland affect his work? What was his relationship to the Jewish community and to Cleveland? Well, his relationship to Cleveland, it was, it was simpatico. Cleveland was Harvey and Harvey was Cleveland. He's been called the poet laureate of Cleveland. I mean, he loved Cleveland to his core. And he, he becomes a champion for Cleveland. You know, certainly we have off the streets of Cleveland comes in American Splendor, but then we have his graphic novels. Harvey P. Carr's Cleveland is terrific. Um, it really, it, it explores the history of Cleveland, right? We deal with, you know, Cleveland sports misery and, you know, aspersions of the, the um, mistake by the lake and the Rockefellers and so forth. And he, he touts the libraries of our city. He loved libraries, he loved bookstores, he loved books. So Harvey is a champion for Cleveland in, in that regard, but he also, he was Cleveland in his very, sometimes, you know, um, crabbiness, right? He would have to, we'd see, there's drawings of him in different books and comics and so forth trudging through the streets of Cleveland in the horrible snow and he's bundled up. And so Cleveland and Harvey are one. And especially, you know, Cleveland for Jews sometimes is kind of limited to the east side. Harvey's Cleveland was not limited to the east side. He would go anywhere. And, but he was very much a fixture in Coventry. So he lived near Coventry, he walked there. And he was also a fixture at the Cleveland Heights Public Library. So we have different um, images of him in, say, Not the Israel My Parents Promised Me, a graphic novel that was published after he died, in which he's in the public library. So I know the librarians loved him there. He just, there was some article in The Plain Dealer a couple of years ago in which they talked about the greatest Clevelanders and Harvey was on there. I don't remember, like maybe number 39 or something was there. You got Rockefeller, you have LeBron James, you have Drew Carey, and you have Harvey Picar. So really Cleveland and Harvey are aligned at his funeral, um, his place of belonging, you know, wasn't Israel, it wasn't, you know, Israel, but from what I've read, it was expressed that his place of belonging was Cleveland. That's what he had in his heart. It's a really powerful statement that he makes at the end of one of his books. I think, um, not the Israel my parents promised me, that his place of belonging is Cleveland. Um, and I want to ask you about, specifically about Harvey and Israel, but could you say something about um, the theatrical adaptations of American Splendor and the film, uh, and, and just a little bit more about that success of American Splendor? So there were some theatrical adaptations, not in Ohio, but what's I think the most interesting adaptation of his life 
was the film adaptation. It won lots of acclaim. It won an award at Sundance. Um, he actually, it was actually nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay for the, for the, in the Academy Awards. But what America, American Splendor, this film, is kind of, is, it's like a hybrid film. You have live actors playing Harvey and the other people in his life, his wife, Joyce Brabner, and so forth. And then you have these sort of animated moments that, that creep into it. And at the same time, you have Harvey himself, real Harvey, who pops in and has things to say. It's incredibly creative. It recreates um, one of Harvey's very, um, very Jewish, but also I think incredibly clever comics um, about Jewish ladies in supermarkets, which we don't have an image of now, but I encourage all listeners to really look up Harvey after this discussion, read about him and read Sean's book, most importantly, not the Harvey chapter, not only the Harvey chapter, but all the chapters. And so this, that film, um, I think Harvey hoped it would propel him to fame perhaps a little bit more. He was always frustrated with money and that comes out in his comics and his, in various other adaptations. But after the film, he, he said, it didn't make me rich. He, he, he groused, it didn't, it's, no matter what, it still didn't make me rich. And he stayed, he always stayed, you know, a little bit bitter when he was on the red carpet for the Academy Awards, someone, you know, asked him a question about it. And he said, it's all, and then an expletive. You know, he's, he's in this, you know, this beautiful environment. He's nominated for an award and he says, it's all, and I won't go any further on that one. So um, you said that, that it propelled him to, to greater fame, certainly. Um, is that what was responsible for him getting on David Letterman, do you think? He was, had several appearances on the David Letterman show. So David Letterman was decades before. Okay. So David Letterman was in the late 70s. And um, yeah, so he, did, he was on David Letterman um, several times, and it was a challenging relationship. They butted heads. And Harvey perhaps was given bad advice before he went on screen saying, you know, maybe be a little bit difficult, but Harvey's already difficult a lot of the time. So they kind of, they, they argued a little bit, Harvey egged him on, and then of course, David Letterman egged Harvey on. He said, after one, one appearance, my apologies to Cleveland. I mean, you can't hurt Harvey more than that. Um, and, but then, so these, these, Interviews were, could be difficult to watch. Um, Harvey called David Letterman a shill at one point for GE, but in the end, so when David Letterman retired, but Harvey was already dead, Harvey said, I'm sorry, David Letterman said, Harvey was a great guest. The problem was my immaturity. So it was, it was an after the fact later apology, which I, I appreciated. No, I, I wanted to mention that because I think maybe some of the people on on the call on the at the event here um, may remember that that was that was something that was you know, kind of news for such a Cleveland figure. Um, I, I promised we would talk about his connection to Israel. Um, can you say more about his views there? We touched on it a bit already, but well, Harvey. Harvey's parents were Orthodox. They were Polish immigrants. His mother was a communist. Um, um, she was, his mother was a Zionist and his dad was a Talmudic scholar. They were Orthodox. And so he grew up hearing about Israel and we, the, the potential establishment of the state of Israel. And when in fact Israel was established, they told him that they thought it was miraculous. So Harvey grew up with that rhetoric and I imagine at first he was thrilled as well, but ultimately he was incredibly disappointed. He was anti-nationalist. He felt that he felt that Israel used the Holocaust as a as to sort of allow, exploited the Holocaust to to kind of allow aggression. You know, we must do this. He was satisfied dissatisfied with pro-Israel policies over time. And he was sympathetic to Palestinians. And Harvey was concerned that ultimately he would be viewed as, you know, a bad Jew or, you know, or not viewed well in the Jewish community because of these um, perspectives. And it's okay to have those perspectives. And he explores them in Not the Israel My Parents Promised Me, which we have an image of. Do you want to show the we image? Do. Well, let me go to that. 
Um, I, that's it's this next one, I think. One more. No one. One more. Sorry, I bat, I bypassed it. There we go. I have a blank screen. You there we go. It. Okay. Great. So this is a page from Not the Israel My Parents Promised Me. It's illustrated by J.T. Waldman, who is a really terrific artist. And really within this particular graphic novel, J.T. and Harvey travel through um, Cleveland, at their, you know, and they talk about Israel. They talk about how they wrestle with the religious, political, and personal histories they have with Israel. You know, the conflict within Israel, and the book tells the story of the Jewish people in Israel from ancient times up to the current moment. So it's, it's a long history. Um, and it, it, this particular page, which is a really inventive, inventive visually, shows the two of them driving. They're driving across the Detroit Superior Bridge, which you can get a sense of, and then they ultimately drive off the page. So here, you know, let's see. Harvey says in one of the speech bubbles, oh, I don't know. I'm just tired of people saying I'm a self-hating Jew because I'm critical of Israel or make fun of old Jewish ladies, which refers to the comic that I meant, mentioned earlier. So he, he's, he's, he's grappling with his own feelings and they're understandable feelings. And that's what this book is about. Right? How does he want, he's very much a Jew and he's proud to be a Jew, but how do you separate your Jewishness from your connection to the state of Israel? And it's, it's a black, it's a black and white and you can see that it's, you know, it's very finely drawn. And it also takes us through Cleveland at the same time. They go to Gallucci's, they, they get food, they're in the public library. So we see Cleveland as well here. I think one of the, real poignant features of the book, as we've already mentioned, really is at the end when he really says uh, and, and that his place of belonging is here in Cleveland. Uh, and, and it's just, it, it's interesting because of the connection to place. Uh, and when, of course, when we study local Jewish history, we're really interested in, in place. Um, I want to, to be cognizant of our time, our short time too. Um, mm -hmm. I want Ashley to draw everyone's attention to one of the other images that I had. Um, not the blank screen of Harvey driving through a snowstorm, um, but this is the image from The Quitter. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I, I my words are very simple. I think it's really even more autobiographical perhaps than some of his other work in some way, even more focused on Cleveland, although much of his work was. Um, but I wanted to, to draw attention to this panel, this page of panels here, because it uh, relates to the, uh, actually the other essays in the book on suburbanization that we talked about uh, last week or a couple weeks ago at the previous event. Um, so, you know, this starts really with his description of living in the Mount, in the Mount Pleasant Kinsman neighborhood uh, and then leaving. Uh, and could you just kind of walk us through the page here and kind of tell us what you notice and, and some interesting things about the work that we see here? Yes. So this is just one page from the quitter. Dean Haspel is the, is the artist. And you know, I think that it's important never to privilege the artist or privilege the writer. This is a marriage of text and image and it's really important to see that this is a collaboration. So this, this, was, this is the quitter and it's a story about Harvey exploring much autobiography on a larger level, but he, that he was a quitter. He, he got frustrated, for example, when he was at Case Western Reserve. He didn't do well in a class, so he dropped out. And so he tells this story of his life in this really, it's got kind of a shadowy kind of film noir style to it. And, you know, really beautiful shading. The art is great. And so he says here, and there's got various panels and speech bubbles. And then we have, you know, narrative boxes in which 
he says, his, he, Harvey's finding out, oh, we're gonna move to a Jewish neighborhood. That'll be nice. And they're leaving Mount Pleasant. This particular panel, this particular page is also about Harvey's embarrassment of his father, his father's old clothes and his accent, which is very common among first generation Jews. But we can see in the very horizontal panel at the center, which is an inventive approach, his dad saying, Herschel, come on, we've got to go. And it's, but it's an, an accent. And Harvey's really very good at you know, creating cadence and a sense of speech in many different comics in American Splendor and beyond. So here we have Harvey in various panels learning about this particular moment in his life, which is a pivotal one. He moves to Shaker Heights, and this is very much a Cleveland Jewish history moment, right? The move, the move from the city out to the suburbs. Um, his father, Saul, was a grocer. He owned a grocery store in the Kinsman, on Kinsman. So then we have you know, this particular page, which takes us on to the rest of Harvey's story, to his years as a jazz critic, you know, his attempt to be a jazz critic, and his marriages, and his life in Cleveland, both Jewish and otherwise. Well, thanks for walking us through that. I, I wanted to make sure that we focused on at least uh, a couple of pages from his work, so, so that, that's great. Um, how would you evaluate his place in American Jewish literature? How is he, how do you think he will be viewed, uh, is he viewed now and decades from now? Well, I think gr graphic novels are only now getting the respect that they should be. Certainly Spiegelman's Mouse helped, it won a special Pulitzer Prize, but still some people look at graphic novels as being as being inferior literature. Harvey has been recognized by the comics community, winning posthumous awards and awards in his own life. But as far as his place in Jewish American literature, once graphic narratives, graphic novels are admitted into the canon and they, into the canon beyond graphic novels, into literature as a whole, I am, have no doubt that Harvey's work will be applauded not only because what he writes is insightful and honest, but because of the artists that he employed that make, you know, that really create the Har Harvey's world so beautifully and so powerfully. Thanks, thanks. So it, it's, it's interesting to me because of the development of graphic novels. I really feel like they've exploded in the past 20 or 30 years. Um, and they seem so common now, but I think they're still not common for, for many readers. Um, can you mention um, some of his other works that he wrote, especially in his later life? Um, he, he published quite a bit, really. Yes, he was, he was very busy. Once he, so American Splendor is in part about his middle class life, right? His, life as a VA clerk. Um, he began that job in 65. He then you know, retires um, not until the 20th century, you know, the beginning of the 21st century. And so sort of the, the everyday life he didn't have to play on anymore. And then he starts writing other books and having them illustrated more histories, like the history of Studs Terkel or the Beat Poets, because he, he, his mind was so expansive and he was interested in so many different topics. He edited a book about Yiddish culture. It's called Yiddishkeit. Um, I really recommend it. Really interesting essays in there, both visual and written. Um, but then, you know, Harvey Picar's Cleveland was like, I think I see it as his magnum opus. I'm so interested in it um, as a scholar of Jewish American art. I'm looking forward when we get back on campus at some point to teach it in my graphic novel class. And it's not just a Jewish graphic novel class. I think it is so important about, it's important to tell us something about Jewish history, Cleveland's history, and the history of graphic novels. Great. Um, how, uh, just, just a few more questions and then we can, we can open this for, for questions um, for, or comments from people in the chat, uh, certainly. Um, how has Harvey been memorialized in Cleveland? Uh, and, and what do you think of those efforts to remember his role in the community here? 
Well, Clevelanders try and, you know, sort of grasp on to what they can grasp on to. And let me say that the beginning of memorializing comic makers in Cleveland is with Siegel and Schuster. And I think that the efforts to memorialize Harvey are dwarfed in relationship to Siegel and Schuster to this point, and they could be more. But so Siegel and Schuster, as many of you Clevelanders know, is um, created Superman and Superman. Oh, Sean. Hold on. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Just it, it popped into my face. Um, <laughs> let me go back. So Siegel and Schuster, Superman is memorialized, is rec recognized and remembered at the Hopkins Airport. You come down through baggage claim, you see the whole display. Then we have Superman license plates. I personally have one. Um, the lot, there's a lot from one of the Superman creators um, is surrounded by panels of Action Comics number one, the first Superman comic book and so on. So Harvey's gotten a measure of attention too, as he should. In the Cleveland Public Library, the, Cle the Cleveland Heights Public Library, there's a sculpture of him. If there's a desk and there's a sculpture of him, it looks like he's walking out of a comic book page. And on the back of that sort of, that slate, that, that sculpture is actually um, an area where you, could, you can draw, like chalk draw. And it's to encourage the making of art, the writing of art, the writing of comics or graphic novels. And also in the Cleveland Public Library, Cleveland Heights Public Library, we have the Harvey and Friends sort of used book library. There's a work of art by J.T. Waldman hanging there as well. My favorite, and I didn't get one, is the Cleveland Public Library had a limited edition library card with Harvey on it. And it was a picture of him. It was of, it's, it's of him looking towards the Cleveland, main Cleveland Public Library on a snowy day with his hat on and he's all bundled. So that was, I should have gotten that. I wish they would reissue it. And then <clears throat> in Coventry, there's a courtyard that's named after him. And there are some panels of his comics that hang from lampposts and they're really beautiful. And I encourage all of you to go to Coventry and get a bite to eat and go to the Harvey Peacock Courtyard and see these beautiful panels. I don't even know if they're up right now because of COVID, but, and if anybody does in the chat bar, please say if everything's you know, back to normal there. But in any case, Harvey has been memorialized here. He has been remembered. And I think that what he would want most, he'd want to be remembered by all of you reading some of his work. It's available in the library. Um, there are you know, dozens of copies of all of these books in the library. And I suggest that you read them. Yeah, really, I, I would just really uh, encourage you to read them too. Uh, if, you ha if you've been discouraged from reading them because you've seen them as comics or graphic novels and that might not be something that you normally read, um, really, um, you, you should still check them out. They, there's quite a bit there that you can find and they're really easy and accessible and I think you'll appreciate the story. It's very much a, a Jewish story from from Cleveland. And, and so that's why I'm always very excited to, to talk about him. Um, you know, I, can you say anything about his gravesite? Samantha Harvey is buried in Lakeview Cemetery uh, and his gravesite is kind of interesting. So yes, his grave, oh, let me just say, so I can see that somebody, some people are trying to like write chats to me and Gary is one of them. I can't read the chats. I just see my name popping up. So I just want to, oh, okay. well, so, to me, I'm not ignoring you. I just can't deal with it. If you have a question to, to address for the group, please put it in the group chat and we'll call it out shortly. Yes, I, and I'll be glad to talk to anybody at another time too. But let me just mention, so Harvey is buried in Lakeview Cemetery right near Elliot Ness. And his grave is just a quote from, you know, sort of his writing, you know, but what's interesting is that as Jews, when we visit Jewish graves, we put down stones to show that we were there. People come to his grave and they put pens in the, in the dirt right in front of it. There are dozens and dozens of pens there. Sean and I visit. And it's just, it's, it's really beautiful. I find it incredibly you know, moving to see it. Um, and I think, and sometimes the pens are taken out and I see like a, a sort of you know, recycling of pens over time in there. 
So thanks for pointing that out. That's really, I think that's something that is also easy to visit. So I encourage you to do that as well. Um, you know, I think let's actually, if we can turn to some of the comments in the, in the chat, um, just to kind of point out, and if anybody has specific questions, they can, they can write them as well. I, I wanna point out just a couple of things. Um, we've heard from a cousin of Harvey's in the chat, Anne, Anne Kroc. Uh, her, she writes, my dad, uncle, and family business are mentioned in the Quitter. As she remembers uh, his parents, Aunt Dora and Uncle Charlie, as she would have called them. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, and I also want to point out uh, the artist Gary Dumb's comments. Um, he has uh, mentioned a few different things, but also draws our attention to the third floor of the Cleveland State Library, uh, the home of the Cleveland Memory Project where there's a mural that he and his wife, Lara, did entitled Our Love Letter to Cleveland. Um, he says it's eight feet tall by 60 feet long, and it includes Harvey and American Splendor, as well as Steve Schuster and many other people, and things that made and make Cleveland a great place. So, so thanks for, for your work there. Um, we're, we're, we very much like thinking of Cleveland as a great place, of course, uh, all, all of its, um, uh, and all of its pluses and minuses in consideration. Um, there's also uh, some, a, a tip that you might want to think about too. The county library also has uh, eBooks that can be gotten online easily these days. So that really is something to check out as well. Um, so uh, Samantha, any comments in response to any of that or kind of la a couple questions still left for you. But um, any any comments on on those comments in the chat? I can't see any comments in the chat. Okay, well, just what I you know, just kind oh. of what I referred to there. Um, <clears throat> no, I think that I think that I'd like to get into some more meaty comments. Okay, um, okay, I don't see any really from uh, you know in in the chat about specific questions about um, the the text. Mm -hmm. uh, or anything like that. Um, can we go back to the um, Superman comic? That yeah, sure. You want me to show it on the screen? Talk about that, and I'd love to talk about that for a second. Okay, let's do that. Let me give me a second to work that out. Okay. Oh, it's the wrong one, of course. All right. So okay. I just, I think that this particular, this particular comic, um, it's what Superman means to me. It'll come up in a second again. Oh, um, this, this is the one, the one you wanted. The, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. I'm patient. I, I went, uh -huh. Okay. There we go. All right. I think that this is really important because it brings together all of these ideas um, about comics makers in Cleveland. Um, this is an amalgamation, certainly, of Harvey, Harvey and Superman, in short. And this was made, <clears throat> this was a, a three-part a three collaboration. Harvey wrote it, Gary Dumb drew it, and R. Crumb added, um, did the little, the, the, the thought bubble, right? The crazy Harvey and the schlubby Superman. And again, this is just one little part from a three pager. So in short, Harvey is jealous, right? He's envious of the success of Superman to a degree. And he's thinking in this speech bubble. It's a great, it's, it's beautifully done. You know, Chazer, Hilaria, fake, a rich Jewish superhero like you hogs the whole comic book field, won't do a thing for a serious Yiddish writer like me. So what he's railing against, and it's fair, is that the American public embraces superheroes, escapist kinds of fantasies, and Harvey's doing something real, right? He's a serious Jewish writer, and he feels that he's being ignored. And he's, he was critically ignored for a long time, and he should be much better respected and read and understood. And so then there's a glossary for the average reader, right? Chazer means pe, hilaria, you know, he, he, you know he's, he's defining the Yiddish. And Harvey grew up speaking Yiddish. And then we've got Superman. 
I mean, look at this Superman. This is no Christopher Reeve, right? Oof, oh, Rachmanis, Rachmanis. Harvey, please, I ain't got time to help everybody, do I? I gotta fight big Goyish villains like Luther. We got the Jewish welfare fund for guys like you. Harvey can take something serious, you know, important to him and still turn it into something funny, still make it important um, in his mind, but also amusing for the reader and give us sort of food for thought. And this also brings back um, his ability to really create, you know, capture cadence with his writing, with his prose. I love the Yiddish references here, if I can just interject yeah. that. Um, and, and these are, you know, these are, this is real speech, real language. Um, you know, cholera, you know, this, this literally means cholera. It's a, you know, kind of a curse word in Yiddish and Polish. Um, so we get that language. We also get the reference to the Jewish welfare fund, you know, that this was something that was a part of his world. He was a part of this larger community. And, uh, and he was really as integral to it, really, as anyone else. Um, yeah, so thanks for pointing that one out. Um, I don't want to have the last word on that, Samantha. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, I think I want to say that, you know, Harvey and Cleveland are so intimately intertwined. And I think in the end, you know, the tagline, you know, from off the streets of Cleveland comes. Harvey told his stories from off the streets of Cleveland because for him, all roads led to and stayed in Cleveland. And I think that's really beautiful. And I think that, you know, what he did for our city and what he's done for comics and graphic novels is significant. And I think that's, that's a way to end. Okay, so we, we have some questions now in the chat. Oh, so, so let me bring those up for you. Um, we have a question. Um, let's see, let me just get there. Um, first, a question really specifically about my cancer years. Can you tell us about that work of Harvey's? So Harvey and his wife, Joyce Brabner, wrote a graphic novel or, you know, about his cancer years. He actually had a recurrence of cancer when he died. That's not why he died, but it has started to come back and it's exploring, you know, he's so, Harvey is so forthright and honest about everything. And he talks about, you know, that moment in his life, right? what it was like to be diagnosed with cancer, what it's like to try and recover from cancer. So it's just, it's a very honest account. And it's, it's, that's available in the Cleveland Public Library too in multiple copies. And that was a collaboration with Joyce Radner. Um, we had a question too, the, uh, Harvey's wife, is she still in the Cleveland area? Is she working on anything related to graphic novels and or comics? So she is in the, she is, she still lives in their home and she is a, accomplished um, writer in her, you know, writer as well. She was also very politically active. And I don't know what she's working on right now, but I know that she always had a lot of interesting projects in the pike. Okay, thanks. Um, we, uh, another question too. Um, this is, uh, let's see. I understand, this is from Travis Pollard. I understand that Harvey was the writer on all of his work. Would you say that Harvey had any particular visual influences that he would add through his collaborations beyond the specific Cleveland settings? Well, hello, Travis, a past student from forever ago of mine. And he, so Harvey, the interesting thing about working with art, other artists is that, you know, you're sometimes at their whim. In other words, like our crumbs style, we can see right here with the crazy Harvey, you know, it's this eye popping out of your head kind of style. And so sometimes, you know, Harvey would suggest things to artists. He had one particular story called Violence in which he, um, he employed somebody to do the art who was a Marvel comics maker, or he was, you know, he dealt with the artistic, elements when he wrote kind of a satire of Mal Art Spiegelman's mouse. He wanted an artist to specifically make art like Art Spiegelman did. So in that regard, that's his influence, right? He has a verbal influence. He has, you know, he can put in his two cents worth, but he also had long conversations with his artists about um, how he wanted the panels to look. You know, he would make stick figure essentially stick figure panels and hand them to the artist. And then, you know, that's a collaboration too. 
it was all very much a collaboration, stylistically, format, panels, and so forth. Thanks. I, I, we are trying to keep these events really at just, just about an hour. Um, and so we're getting there. And I think I uh, have just kind of one more question for you to, to close. Um, thank you so much for telling us all about Harvey and uh, his connections to Cleveland, his connections to the Jewish community. Uh, he's, it's really important for us to, to remember him. And I do encourage all of the participants here tonight to, to take a look at his books if you haven't. Uh, to explore some of the other topics that he wrote about as well, uh, Yiddishkeit, jazz, Macedonia, all kinds of different topics. Um, I wanted to ask Samantha to close really just a, an unrelated question, but about her future work, because she's got an, a, an especially interesting topic I think that she's working on, uh, and it gives us an idea of what people in the field are, are interested in and thinking about uh, and how this field of Jewish art history continues. So what's, what's your next project? Okay, Sean, so my next project is very far from comics and graphic novels. And it turns out that what seemed to be a very untimely project is incredibly timely. I'm writing a book right now about a 19th century Jewish American sculptor that most people haven't heard of, but I think they will soon. His name is Moses Jacob Ezekiel. And he's just a fascinating figure for so many reasons. He was one from one of the first Jewish families on American soil. He grew up in Richmond, Virginia. He was the first Jewish cadet at the Virginia Military Institute. Um, there's a lot of firsts in his life. He did the, the, um, the first commission by a Jewish communal organization in this country was given to Moses Ezekiel. It's the large sculpture of religious liberty in front of the American Jewish History Museum in Philadelphia. And it was given to him by B'nai B'rith. But what makes him particularly timely, because I was just doing an excavation of a great artist who was so famous in his own time, who was you know, conferred honors by kings and queens and who was an expat in Italy, but he made Confederate monuments. He fought on the Confederate side during the Civil War. And right now he's got, there, he's got about a dozen Confederate monuments in this country. And what do we do with this sort of this multiple, the multiple identities of figures? I mean, he's a great sculptor, but then how do we reconcile his Confederate monuments with the idea that this is great art and it can be torn down, right? What do we do? You know, his Jewish identity is so important to him, but he was also a Confederate. His family owned slaves. So I'm grappling with those issues as I write this new book, which I hope will be done in like maybe seven or eight months, but I'm stymied by coronavirus and I can't get to archives and I can't get my kids to school and I don't have time to concentrate. But I am certain that you'll get it done. So, so we're, we're looking forward to that and I'm sure we'll all have a chance to, to learn more about Moses Jacob Ezekiel and Confederate monuments. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. Dahlia, can you close Sean, I, I want to thank you and Samantha, thank you so much. That was fascinating. I'm really grateful for your time, both of you, um, and to everyone who joined us. Gary, um, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you with us, too. Um, I wanted to, Sean, ask you um, if you could share again the name of your book and how people can order it if they want to read this chapter or any of the chapters. So the title is Cleveland Jews and the Making of a Midwestern Community. And I edited the book with John Grabowski, uh, our chief historian at the Historical Society. Uh, and it was published by Rutgers University Press. You can order it directly from them with a 30% discount that I posted in the chat earlier. Um, or you can order it from any bookstore that you like and, and find it online. Um, and as I said, it covers many different topics. And if you're from the Cleveland area, I think you'll certainly find something familiar in there. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for joining us again. If you have any questions about um, anything you've seen tonight, or um, you'd like to review the two previous lectures that Sean did about his book, um, you get be in touch with us and we can um, review um, online. The recordings are available on our website. So thanks to everyone and um, we look forward to seeing you again. 
Thank Have a great 4th of July holiday. Thank you, Samantha. Thanks. Thanks so much.